Welcome to the Redbeard Embodiment Podcast. I am your host, Alex Green, and I'm on a mission to bring the power of embodiment to people all around the world. In this podcast, we explore how embodiment practices, trauma healing, and knowledge about the human nervous system can help us find our ground, discover new sources of meaning, and create connection in an ever-changing world. The deepest change is embodied change. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm sitting here today with Dr. Brian Tierney, and uh, he is known as the Somatic Doctor, at least his professional, uh, his website is Somatic Doctor and his Instagram uh, work as well. And uh, I'm in Boulder, Colorado, as always, and uh, Dr. Tierney is in somewhere in the Bay Area, San Francisco, joining us. And just a quick introduction, um, and then we'll we'll jump in. But um, and can I? Is it okay if I call yeah, you Brian for sure. on the yeah. on the show? Great. So uh, so Brian is a uh, uh, integrative therapy uh, uh, somatic psychotherapist uh, and educator. He has a doctorate in somatic psychotherapy. He both has a private practice uh, doing that work, as well as teaches at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, teaching this work. Um, let's see, I'm going to read something from his official intro. He is an eclectic psychotherapist who uses a combination of talk therapy and education with individuals, families, couples, children, and groups. He's also a seasoned dancer with over 20 years of experience in modalities such as contact improv, capoeira, and authentic music. Um, and I know also Brian has a background in structural integration body work and other body work modalities. And one of my key interests, uh, Brian, in having you uh, on the show is this theme of multimodality or, and, and what what's leaps out from your content online and your website and your background is that over the last 25 years or so, you've been sort of navigating multiple angles of therapeutically uh, studying the human person for everything from body work and trauma resolution models, uh, dance and movement. And in a way, that's really the theme of this podcast overall is how do the, how does sort of embodiment practices in general um, coincide around uh, supporting human development. So I'm hoping that's kind of the conversation we can have today. Welcome, welcome to Thanks, the show. Alex. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk about interdisciplinary stuff and multimodality stuff because, you know, there's so, the, the big trend and the big movement, of course, is to specialization, almost to a ridiculous right. point, right? Where sometimes I make the joke that you can only refer somebody if they have exactly the same history or something like that. And it, it becomes almost ridiculous right. how much specialization there is. And I just love interdisciplinary right. practice and research. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, could we start with, I like to kind of do origin story. Like if you kind of, you know, how, how did you get on this path, path of study in the, in the first place? Yeah, so I grew up in Minnesota, and then, uh, and which was me too, me too, me too. Me too by oh, the really? Way. Minneapolis. No yeah. yeah, I'm from St. Paul. Yep. Yeah. All right. Oh, there cool. Yeah, yeah. The so not only the same yeah. color yeah. scheme uh, this morning, <laughs> a, a, a similar origin. It must be our Minnesotan <laughs> yeah. heritage. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I, yeah. I like to say that it's, uh, Minnesota is a great place to grow up and a great place to leave. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I'm good with you. good I'm with people. You. Yeah. So I grew up there and, yeah. you know, not much somatic awareness there besides, you know, clunking around our heads playing football and, and everything like that. Yeah. Um, when I went to university in Wisconsin, I was a party guy and uh, it just wasn't working for me. And the, it, the reason why I knew it wasn't working for me, like my career path was marketing and, I just, I was in mm. business school and things just weren't lining up for me psychologically and with my friend group and how it showed up for me is in my body. I just got anxious okay. and the symptoms showed up in my body, uh, in my throat in yep. particular. And, um, yep. and then it was, a, if we want to go with the throat and what, the, what the throat often means symbolically is then that catapulted me into 15 years of finding my voice. You know, and right. the first yeah. modality I went to, I think, was like Reiki or something like that. And then it was, uh, right. 
then I, I was I, I enrolled in acupuncture school. I moved out to California, okay. lived at an integrative healing arts school for three years, which is where things really took off for me from this integrative right. health standpoint. I lived with a bunch of like traveling teachers, had all this, all these different uh, experiences with different modalities, different teachers, you know, from like cool. polarity. What was, what was the name uh, of Har that? It was called Harwood Institute. Name uh, and they okay. used to, okay. it was like a, like one of the only residential massage schools uh, in the world, right? right. You, could, you l went to the mountains and people lived there for an entire year. And we're just immersed right. in it, you know, like all organic food, totally off the grid, yeah. you know, straw bale temple yeah. and just this great. Uh, and it was founded by this wonderful man who teaches uh, polarity therapy. You familiar with polarity? Mm. Yeah, yeah, so that, that's in my toolbox, you know, polarity therapy, cool. craniosacral therapy, massage. That, that was kind of the origins for me. And then that catapulted I me see. into a long career doing craniosacral work, which I still do to this day. And then, you know, there's men's yeah, work thrown yeah. in there, all this stuff, right? But it was really Hartwood Institute that was yeah. the hub uh, for my okay. integrative study and practice. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. So, it, so it sounds like if I'm understanding correctly, kind of the beginning professional work was in, in, in um, sort of hands-on body work, acupuncture, craniosacral therapy, et cetera, et cetera, and which you're still carrying with you through today. But then your your interest in, in psychology must have been enough to, to propel you through graduate studies and, and kind of going down that path as well. Do you kind of want, can you speak to just a little bit of what kept pushing you forward in that direction? Yeah. I mean, uh, at Hartwood, um, I was a yoga teacher. I started to get into dance. And there's all these different yeah. folks that when they were doing body work, they were engaged in processes that, um, you know, really got the emotions going. And I was super repressed. Okay. I mean, I grew up in the Midwest, you know, and in Minnesota. Had, yeah, we're not known for our emotional exactly. expressiveness. I was super yeah. repressed. Yeah. So gradually I started to receive yeah. body work that started to get the plumbing okay. going. And I started to then... Yeah express more on the dance floor. And I really just started to open up. I went to men's groups and all that stuff. And then a picture started to mm. emerge about, Hey, you know, it's not just about the body. It's not just about the mind and emotions. It's a, it's an integrated whole. And, um, yeah. and I think, I mean, it was really, uh, probably the men's work doing kind of like somatic work with men doing men's work mm -hmm that really got me thinking about archetypal psychology. So archetypal psychology was kind of my, my passion, my way into the deep study of psychology. And then neurology was there with craniosacral therapy. So, and, and then gradually right. over time, my passion for neurology and archetypal psychology started to converge. Um, especially in the men's, the men's yeah. work and the craniosacral work and the trauma resolution stuff that all kind of put me yeah. in the pipeline to do my doctoral studies. Yeah. Got it. Cool. If somebody was listening and they, and they thought, well, I don't totally, I can't totally picture what somatic men's work would be like. I mean, I, I have my own experience with it, but I'm just thinking about listeners who may wonder what that is could you just sort of speak a little bit to the kinds of you know what i guess maybe what impacted you what kinds of practices um just to give just a little flavor of what the, that environment is like yeah i like to just keep it simple and call it like a specialized type of plumbing <laughs> i mean it speaks to men okay. right because you know like I, right. again i was repressed and stuck in my emotional body and in my physical body i was really limited in my range of expression and right. guys that are trained facilitators in the men's work you know which i later came to be just have a way of reading right. bodies like like a kind of like a a, a rolf uh, method of kind of assessing bodies but more from a kind of emotional plumbing standpoint 
psycho emotional what's what's kind of being repressed that sort yeah, of thing and like the two biggies of course yeah. are grief and rage and, and guys just have a way of reading where the where the body is clogged and and that and, and yeah. it's hard to explain unless you experience it yourself and you've experienced it yourself so you know what i'm talking about um but right. you know for right. newbies you know it's uh I, I like to just keep it simple and say it's plumbing <laughs> Like, get, let's get things moving. Let's right. get the vitality. Yeah, flowing. it kind of yeah. freeing up the emotional, but maybe even sort of, um, yeah, emotional plumbing makes sense to me. But also, you know, I guess I think a little bit like almost um, almost like from a from a Reikian perspective, you know, sort of like freeing the bioenergies and, and, and whatnot as yeah, well. Yeah, and then that can look like getting getting the body moving, doing breath work, you know, touch. Yeah. Um, sometimes yep. it's, uh, you know, reading poetry and things like that, that get, get men out of the linguistic or into different linguistic centers of the brain and so on. So that they think different and can feel differently. Yeah. yeah super cool. Well, for you was a lot of that in kind of like, in like retreat formats, sort of like multi-day intensive kind yeah, of environment. Yeah, it was the Mankind Project. I was involved with the Manco yeah, Mankind sure. Project for about eight, ten years or something like that when I lived in New Zealand. Um, I see. So I trained as a facilitator in that. And just and, and then it was then that I really started to – because archetypal psychology is very much um, circulating in that community, right? So uh, – this right. idea that there could be archetypal energies really uh, fascinated me, made sense, made intuitive sense to me. Um, and that carried right. me into deep studies in psychology. So, well, so uh, this is, again, I'm reading from your website, but what it, what's quoted there is that your doctoral project was an integrative approach to psychology that wove together somatic psychology sociology, anthropology, embryology, neurobiology, mythical studies, and general systems theory, which I, as a person who likes to look at how things intersect, I was like, yeah, cool. I want to read your thesis and your, and your dissertation. Um, could anything you can, could you share just a little bit about, uh, you know, we would need way more time than our hour to, to go into just that piece, but can you talk a little bit about what that folk, that study was? Yeah, well, it. My original inspiration was um, to. I was really curious in, about what we see in somatics is almost kind of like a, a continuum and sometimes split groups, um, where right. we have kind of like a catharsis oriented group. That's very much about letting right. it rip and finding the emotions and just roaring and screaming and, you know, primal, primal scream, scream and, stuff. And, and, yeah, and yeah, um, yeah. you know, the Mankind Project was very much in that camp, you know, kind of dr drama therapy, yeah. cathartic work yeah. um, versus yeah. uh, modalities that are more uh, containment focused. Uh, and yep. that's often having to do with this neurobiological frame of trauma resolution, taking it slow, um, right. Slower is faster. That all whole that thing, stuff. craniosacral work yep. and SEP and just yep. working on, uh, you know, granular sequencing and titration. Yeah. All of that. And I yep. began to see, yep. uh, as a craniosacral teacher and teaching trauma resolution and tra trauma resolution from that perspective that there there's there was like a anti catharsis movement totally yep. 100% and then yep. not only that yep. an anti intellectual movement that was there in the somatics community and that turned me off okay. um so sure. i wanted to because i uh was really um, powerfully moved by drama therapies. Um, they were yeah. very, very meaningful to me being a repressed Minnesotan, yeah. right? I, yes, yeah. I needed yeah. to learn how to get grounded. I, I needed to learn how to contain myself and go slow and work with my own trauma and so on. But for me, it was right. essential that I could learn how to just let the life force move through me and to be expressive in that way. So, so that what inspired the dissertation was like how to bring these two together 
in a kind of more Got integrated cool. theory. Um, yeah. nice. And it's, yeah. it's not easy to do because it's a, it's a, you know, it's a pretty wide continuum, right? So yeah, right. there's a lot, there's a lot there, especially when you bring in the archetypes. And so the, so the idea is like, I wanted to bring in archetypal theory. Okay. Right. Because, you know, the idea with archetypes is, is that they're, that they're, you know, themes that cut across cultures that really grab right. us. In mythology. In mythology. Yeah. Could and, you, could you name just a few of the, you know, just give us three or four of some of the common ar archetypes that, you know, that just, just so we can relate, you know, warrior. Yeah, warrior. Let's or, start with the yeah. warrior, right? So the warrior is yeah. our aggressive systems, right? You know, whereas mammals, yeah. we just have that. We have aggression, aggression circuitry and we either yeah. do aggression well or we don't do aggression well. Um, but again, right. you know, so like aggression as a, aggression is a word, right? You know, and there's all these words in psychodynamic theory mm. and all these words in neurobiology. Mm. And I have those frameworks and they're interesting to me. Um, but what's yeah. most compelling to the human imagination is story. And that's where the yeah. archetypes show yeah. up. They show up in stories. They show up in myths. They show okay. up in dreams. They show right. up in psychotic process. So it was really yeah. compelling to me um, to have that archetypal image of the warrior. And not only have the that archetypal image of the warrior, but to understand that that is a system. It's a, neuro, a psycho neurobiological system okay, that has cultural... Okay ramifications and has impacted culture influenced culturally shaped culturally right. culturally is in a, a yeah. reciprocal tension relationship with an opposing mm -hmm. system okay called the lover okay and the lovers yeah, are yeah, attachment yeah. systems so you know like attachment yeah. uh neurobiology for example again lots of words words right. words words but then we have this yeah, timeless yeah, yeah. image yeah. The feeling, the feeling, yeah, the feeling yeah, and yeah. the narrative is what's compelling to the mind, right? That's what the that's what the, our brains right. do. They it, our, our our brains uh, socially engage in narrative. You right. know, our bodies right. socially engage yeah. in narrative. We are narrative uh, organisms. Definitely. You know? Definitely. So then I yeah. got really interested in the tension between the opposites, uh -huh. right? And then. That's right. what yeah. uh, that my passion was to kind of understand and map out. Okay, if there's systems in the, how do the systems in the psyche, the the tension systems in the psyche, how do that that right. how does that right. map onto the body? How yeah. does that map onto family dynamics and social dynamics? Okay, and how mm. might that be mm. an expression of certain fundamental tensions in biology? Namely, how the body constructs itself in a tension field embryologically. Okay. okay. And then so that, yeah. you know, and that passion came from the field of study called biodynamic craniosacral therapy, which is right. very interested right. yeah. in yeah. Uh, embryology. In, in embryological yeah. development. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. So yeah. it, it's like, you know, there's so much there and so much to talk about, but I guess to simplify it, right, is that we are a distributed tension grid, you know, and, and that's yeah. where the fossil research comes in there too. So the psyche is like yeah. that. It's a distributed tension grid and it either distributes the tensions well or not well. You know what I mean? Right. Society yeah. is yeah. a distributed yeah, yeah. tension grid and it the either distributes system, that tension sure, yeah. well or not well, usually not well. Harmoniously or, or <laughs> usually yeah, not yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. And, and and so is the embryo and so is the universe, right? So, I see. So is this where this this is so I was kind of wondering where does the general systems theory the come in? And I I think I might be hearing it yeah. right now. That that any system seems to be organized along these principles, yep. and and that um, you can probably gather that Rol uh, that Ida Rolf is in there, right? You know that yeah. idea that yeah. um, there's a structural integration that can occur yeah. over time when we're working directly with the distributed tension system, the tension system of the of the myofascial yeah. system, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Super. Can I just, I want to just, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, ch- cheerlead something for a moment, if it's okay. Um, cause I love the, uh, you know, this, you know, that central theme you presented of how do you reconcile the value of these more, uh, expressive and dynamic and, and, um, cathartic models with sort of some of this neurobiology and, and that's, that's sort of more focused uh, tra- trauma resolution models that are, that are focused on titration. And, and I, and I just wanted to share that, that that's a big interest of mine too. And, and it's something that I've sort of wrestled with part of my own journey around exploring multimodally has been because I don't want to, I want to have the good of one thing, but not exclude the good of something else. And like, but, but in some of my early days, it's like, you know, I, my most early body work training was, or, or body oriented training was in the martial arts. And so for me, that was kind of my, um, you know, uh, I, I kind of got thrown into the, I didn't have much of a warrior ar- archetype, but then I got thrown into Japanese uh, kendo fencing and I quickly realized I better get my neurobiology in order to support aggression <laughs> um, or else I was going to be toast. Um, and so, so, so for me, I had some big experiences like that. And then, and then my most early therapeutic work was uh, a form of structural integration body work. And it was in a particular lineage that was pretty cathartic. It was fairly strong work, pretty emotive, pretty expressive. Um, and then when I got interested in the neurobiology side and I kind of gravitated towards somatic experiencing and things like that, that's when I really sort of saw that there was now this tension within the somatic world where, you know, people were talking about, oh, well, you're an old school rolfer, but, you know, I'm a new school rolfer where we, yeah, you know, where, one. It, where you know, we don't, you know, so you kind of hear these things. And, and I thought to myself, this is a false dichotomy because there's definitely value in slowing down and, 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 and working with what the system can accommodate, especially when, you know, when we get around trauma. So sensitivity is like, you know, huge. And, but let's not forget that, that, you know, we're human beings and dynamic experiences and sometimes those express in big energies. So, so how do we kind of hold both? So I just wanted to quickly say that I love the theme that you explored there. So that's my piece. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I'm really interested in the tingle response, Alex. The tingle, okay. like the, the goosebump yeah. response. Uh, totally. And I just had yeah. one after you. It was the first one of our interview today, where I just had a whole tingle okay. response. Uh, involuntary okay. pilo erection is the term. I, I it just sounds so good, doesn't it? <laughs> I love that Wait, involuntary pilo yeah. erection. The little muscles, uh, nice. pylori, or I can't remember the pilo muscles on the. Uh, they're tiny little right. muscles on the pores, right? But you know, it's it, it's right. really interesting, it, and the psychological literature shows that people that are high in openness tend to have the uh-huh. tingle response more. So maybe that's a pitch for my ah. openness. Maybe I'm being slightly uh, arrogant or something. I don't know. But anyways, I just wanted to say, I just wanted to share that that science, share that somatic moment, share the joy because there's bliss that goes in that tingle response for me. It tells totally. me that something we're on the same channel or we're, there's, there's a, res- a resonant there's a, there's field a resonance. here and that it feels good to me. So I just wanted yeah. to name that. Oh, thank just you. Just wanted yeah. to name yeah, that. Yeah. And, and because it, it matters yeah. a lot, this tension, right? And, and, and that it, it, what I like to say is that identity can be a gluey thing because to me, what okay. can happen is, is that you have, you know, uh, pockets of research and practice. Okay. Let's yeah. take, for example, yeah. um, the interpersonal neurobiology, uh, uh, milieu of Dan research, Siegel and, Dan yeah. Siegel. It's kind yeah. of Neo Buddhism. Yeah. Uh, it's right, mindfulness right. based. It's intersubjectivity right. based. It's kind of like, let's focus yep. on, uh, essentially slowing down. Okay. And okay. there's uh, identity based factors where people identify and, 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 mm. and of course it, it, stuff like this takes us on a journey. It opens us up. It's meaningful. It puts us in touch with the, the big meaningful flow of life. And so obviously right. we would become identified with these things, 
you know, like I, right. uh, things that are very meaningful to us are, they just become almost like the center central organizing principle of our life. Um, yeah. And, and that's good until it's not good. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's one of the things yeah. that, or the primary thing that's at play here that I write quite a bit about in my book that I'm conjuring up. And so you got like, you know, for example, the, um, the slow approach to trauma resolution, which is informed right. by the, the uh, neurobiology of trauma, okay, informed right. by an interlocks with the interpersonal neurobiology community. And then it shows up in clinical practice as a very specific right. pacing, a very right. specific yep. tempo. Yeah. That right. is slow yep. and, uh, and coherent, but then th there's some element of identity that comes in where th this community under the umbrella and under the kind of ages of um, self-regulation, because that, that's the, that's like the mantra, right? That's that's that the mantra, is the mantra. Yeah, self regulation. Self regulation. Yeah, for sure. The biology lines yeah. up with it. It had there's a, a, yep. in terms of the attachment biology. Um, yeah. But you know there doesn't seem to be much room for um, dynamism in terms of the intellect because the intellect moves <laughs> right. It it can it can move right. at a at a speed that is a different that is a differential tempo, and right. and right. also the sorts of aggressive uh, potencies that are there in the martial arts, which are creative art. Right. You know, they can yeah. get scapegoated, yeah. and the, and and then also that this side of the river, the self-regulation side of the river can look at, at the other side of the river, the ones, the methodologies that are, um, you know, more cathartic and more dynamic, and then just start to, right. and, and this is filtered through the identity filter, right? That's not us. Right. You're not one of yeah. us. Right. And then over yeah. on that side yeah. of the river, that's the, that's the bad stuff that's re-traumatizing yeah, you guys are re-traumatizing uh, people. Or yep. intellectual yeah. or disembodied <laughs> right. or addicts or right. something like that. And it's just, right, you know what right, I mean? Right. It's ridiculous because there's good yeah. there's good stuff on both sides. But the, oh, the but this slow yeah. stuff is, I mean, it's radically important clinically with traumatized people, totally. of course, yes. But like sometimes I go to right. a workshop uh, and it's like, it becomes a, a huge transgression to actually move with dynamism. To do anything beyond that. Yeah. Well, totally. I mean, so like, like one way to think about it is like, you know, like one of the main um, important uh, axioms of, of, you know, the neurobiological work is, is safety, right? What is, you know, cultivating a sense of safety for the, for the nervous system that helps, you know, shift away from defensive physiology. So that's, in some ways, that's the key ingredient of trauma resolution models is how to restore a felt sense of safety, a neuroception of safety that, that can then create that shift. But, and, and, and like absolutely for in the domain of, of the delicacy of trauma resolution, what a beautiful thing to attune to. Um, but do we live our lives pure with, with, you know, does that mean we can somehow cultivate that there's safety in all moments? No, we're in human environments, competitive environments, uh, um, sometimes antagonistic environments. And what do we do then? So, so, so again, I'm just sort of resonating with what I, what I'm hearing from you. Yeah. And it's not gonna, I don't think it's going to be very safe for our daughters, our young daughters, for example, if we're constantly trying to slow them down and, and impose yeah. upon their nervous systems our, our our concept of what safety means. You know what I mean? It's right. like, 
Yeah, well, you, yeah. you need to slow down so that you can feel safe, my little four year old. I mean, no. Right. I mean, it's, it, it, no, it's, it's like you. you yeah, and yeah. Let's do this thing. Let's play. Let's be dynamic, you know? And that's why I like right. to say, you know, the little thing that I like to say with somatic students is it's not just regulate or self regulate, it's rave and regulate or rock and roll and regulate. You know, the, the sympathetic mm. system itself gets scapegoated by this, um, by, by this, you, totally. you know what I mean? It's like, uh, as, as if to, I do know what yeah. you mean. As if the, as if mobilizing energy is a bad thing. It's yeah. like, you know, like what? <laughs> yeah. Well, I always say, I don't use the term fight or flight nervous system because it, because it makes it sound bad. Um, or at least that's, you know, so, you know, that, 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 so I'm totally with you. We'd be, we'd be, uh. We'd be pretty boring, leading pretty boring lives if we didn't have any sympathetic tone uh, to add to the mix. Exactly. Yeah. Playfulness. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's a big one. Right. And I think that's the uh, one of the big ones in the trauma resolution community is, is that it, it, it has this given the gravity of the work. It's understandable that this happens. But there can be a sliding yeah. into just a like a humorlessness, you uh -huh. know, and and a, la a lack of regard for how important play is. And play is a sympathetic mm. system thing, right? I mean, I mean, right. sure, we could find out a way to play in a parasympathetic way. It can be done. It is done. <laughs> right, but right. like play. It necessitates dynamism and variability yeah. and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, surprise. surprise. And yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. Wow. Um, so I, I, so my mind is going two places at once, but, but one is, um, well, I'll just share a, a, you know, a comment I frequently make around the, around this whole topic of multimodalism, my word, we could, or the word I tend to use or inter, interdisciplinary or whatever, but like I now have a little bit of a sort of a, a litmus test when, you know, I have explored a lot of things, everything from structural integration to Feldenkrais method to, you know, SC, you know, the things that I mentioned to you earlier. And um, as soon as a teacher starts framing things as starts othering other modalities and saying, Oh, you know, the, we have to look at it from a, a functional movement perspective and everything else is downstream of that. Or we have to, you know, we have to look at it from, uh, you know, integration in the field of gravity. As, as soon as somebody makes a claim that there's, that there's sort of some primacy there. Now, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you do need to articulate the philosophy of your modality, but any, but, but when, as soon as people start bad mouthing the efficacy of other things is when my attention starts to drop because my own experience is that these various modalities from dance to martial arts, to different trauma models, to, to all kinds of things, body work, they wouldn't perpetuate if they weren't providing some significant value to to some of the people now they may no one might not be the whole story but but anyway it's just a little bit of a kind of a soapbox oh, yeah. thing for me is that i hate it when there's this attitude of you know of of you know my thing is the best and i'm just going to start to dismiss these other things so i don't know as if, for you who's been very eclectic i wonder if you've seen that if you sense that yeah. uh yeah you gave me another pilo erection alex <laughs> um, so, so yeah and because you're we're, we're in this uh this field this multimodal field that is uh, i think that yeah. it makes us partners in thought and practice in that way right so when i found somebody that's right. tuned into that channel it makes my body thrilled and excited um, because yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, when I was in, you know, I taught in the biodynamic craniosacral community for, you know, for quite some time and there's very right. much this thing in the community, which is, which is one of the things that really turned me off. And it's so prevalent that mm. I ended up kind of doing the thing myself and noticing as I was doing it, I was noticing as mm. I was doing it, like I'm doing it. Ah, I'm doing it. You know, I'm, I'm doing, doing that, that thing. thing yeah, right. Yeah. And then, 
So, and the primary tension or one of the big tensions, because this is a very slow uh, community, it's kind of like their uh, biodynamics is very proud about being neutral. And so the, okay. uh, the, the other modality, specifically usually biomechanical, biomechanical craniosacral work, upledger, 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 upledger style. style, yeah, yeah. Those folks who, yeah. who then get othered, okay, they are right, not right. neutral. They are not yep. the way. Okay. They are not yep. the way. And, you know, as somebody yep. that was very, very touched in the early days by a kind of shamanic based upledger person, um, it yep. didn't, it was always in the background, even as I found myself kind of d- doing the narrative a bit, it didn't line mm-hmm. up. And I knew I wasn't being inauthentic. Mm-hmm. I was, I knew I was doing that othering thing. And this is where actually my studies in psychology really helped a bit, spe- specifically Jungian studies, because the Jungians are okay. super fierce about grandiosity. They, that is mm. like a, a, the Jungian approach I would, I could say could be generalized and narrowed to the the study basically of how how humans have this horrible habit of being grandiose okay interesting you know interesting. that's one yeah. way of understanding the whole jungian apparatus is that it's it it's deeply okay. attuned to how we do grandiosity and so that really helped me to understand oh, okay, there's grandiosity in this community and it's organized in this way. And there's grandiosity mm. in this community and it's organized in this way. And that is not yeah. creating structural integration between the communities. It's not creating that tensegrity system where there's actual crosstalk and interdisciplinary uh, research and practice like there should be. And that's what right. the body does, right? It distributes tensions. Like we should learn from the body because that's because it does it. Right. It does it better than how we do society and identity, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, I'm going to do a big sigh of relief hearing hearing somebody else uh, put it, it much more beautiful and sophisticated language to something that I've been I've been thinking a lot about. So very cool to hear all of this. Um, I wonder if we could pivot a little bit, you know, there's, there's a bunch of parts of your story that are really interesting. Like, like, you know, from a part of me isn't like, I want to hear about your dance and, and all of that. But, but I think what's, what's more pressing is, could you talk a little bit about your, your, your practice, your clinical practice these days? Because I'm trying to imagine for myself. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to work with you. Um, am I doing touch modalities? Am I doing talk modalities? Am I doing all of those things? Is all my work in person with you? I'm just really curious about how you're practicing, if you're willing to share. Yeah, so I do, I would say, 40 to 60% in-person work. Um, yeah. And there's most definitely a talk therapy, meaning-making component. Um, yep. Yeah. There's a, a percentage of my client base that wants more of that and a percentage of my client base that wants less of that. Um, okay. So, you know, yeah. it's being an interdisciplinary multimodal guy, I'm still going to be on some level following what a person's imperatives are. You know, so if they're, sure. for example, if they're really interested in doing work with the imagination and they want to make meaning, uh, and that yep. is what floats their boat and they find a lot of healing in that, uh, in that angle, yep. then we'll go there. But even if, but okay. one of the things that, one of the things that does cut across my work, no matter what the approach is, yep. whether it's a lot of talking or it's mainly kind of, yeah tracking body sensations and doing, for example, memory, traumatic memory work. Um, yeah. Is, uh, folks yeah. are generally on my table. Okay. And I'm okay. generally doing it, okay. uh, touching them. And I'm generally yep. using still, even despite the, the critical appreciation that we've shared about the slow stuff, I'm generally doing things quite slow. 
yeah, um, yeah, you yeah. know, in terms of it's a craniosacral touch. So I'm just essentially touching the autonomic ner- nerve plexi system. Yeah. 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 And then just yeah. tracking uh, with them sensation, but also basically kind of doing talk therapy with touch. Um, yeah, yeah, that's one yeah. kind of approach. And then another approach is I'm doing my own unique uh, approach to trauma resolution. A lot of people, of course, come in because somatics, the, the buzzword mm-hmm. is uh, glued together kind of with trauma, right? So that right. I would say yeah. that most people come in through my website, uh, having researched trauma. And then, so they'll come in for the trauma resolution work and that's a distinctive, uh, operating mode, uh, treatment mode. Um, that, but how, how it's similar is that the person is still on my table. They're still kind of relaxed. I'm still touching their, their autonomic plexi. And, um, Mm. but their eyes are closed. I, you know, like, for example, I use EMDR tappers with people on the table. I put, Mm. is that those, I actually put them on people's ankles. I find that, um, that it's less intrusive to have the tappers be on the ankles, but I do the work with the eyes closed. So I kind of have my own unique approach to EMDR, um, that involves touch cool. and, you know, kind of my own style of regression work. So there's that. And then Got there's, it. I do also breath work, which is, this is where the dynamic element comes in where I get people just, you know, mm-hmm. doing intense breathing and kind of getting the vitality going, you know, and we're breathing yeah. hard, we're breathing hard and we're getting the affect flowing. And then I also do um, yeah. kind of like a drama therapy approach, which is kind of like a projected um, uh, internal family system approach that's informed by my like with yeah, chair like work chair and work stuff like the that. Person's up in gravity, and I get them to, you know, like I support yep. them expressing and moving their body and acting, acting things, things out, out, speaking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I would say that those yeah. are the main pillars right there. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I do bring cool. in some of the yeah, yeah. Uh, deeper connective tissue work. Uh, not a whole heck of a lot, but I do. I bring that stuff in there. Yeah. 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 I like rolfing cool. faces still. I think faces are really where the rubber hits the road uh, in terms of our identity complexes. Um, so I like to still, I, I, I really, I, I do like to work on faces from a connective tissue perspective because I think the face is w- really where um, psyche and social dynamics meet. Is yeah. meet. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. Interesting. Um. Super cool. What what percentage of your work is? Um, so I know your private practice is a big piece, and I'm, in a in a minute here, I want to ask about your writing project. But on the teaching side, is that a um, uh, uh, tell me just a little bit about what what the education you're doing for other other therapists? Yeah, so uh, I teach in the somatics program at CIIS, um, and I teach neuroscience. Um, which has been a passion okay. of mine since um, since I started to uh, well since craniosacral right so that's been twenty five years uh, I've been studying yeah. the brain and the nervous system for twenty five years now uh, quite yeah. deeply and so it, it really afforded me in creating that curriculum I could really dive deeply into things that I love like the for example the evolution of the neuron I just love to nerd out on stuff like that. Like just, just like mm. the, the research problem is how did the neuron evolve? And then I'm in the literature for like, I'm still in the literature of how the neuron evolved, evolved. after, after probably 15, 15 years of asking that question. Yeah. Wow. Oh my god. So I love, I love to wow. nerd out on that stuff and in the right. background and, and I'm an interdisciplinary researcher, right? So I'll go from embryo, uh, molecular biology to embryology to sociology, yeah. uh, and then back to yeah. archeology, span for example. And, you know, and, and you can see that the, my practice of research is very much like what we've been talking about. You know, it's all, yeah. it's all connected. 
right? So it's just like yeah. a node in the network that I'm picking up. And I'm already assuming yeah. that that node in the network is connected. I just need to figure out and find connector points and use my imagination and my, my research mind to make right. the connection. So I bring that I to the that. students and I've been, yeah. you know, really interested in the default mode network, for example. Um, we talk a lot about the default mode yeah. network in the class. Talk a lot yeah. about interpersonal yeah. neuro. All, all the classic stuff with kind of a, a, yeah. a flair for what I like to call um, re-enchanting science. Mm. That's what I love to do because nice. it's like th there's yeah, something about it, science that can be – yeah, it. yeah. There's something about science that can be, uh, well, grandiose. You know okay. what I mean? Because even yeah. in like, for example, oh, yeah. polyvagal theory is a, is a great example of how grandiose science can get. Like I love Porges's work. I was a joiner yeah, yeah. for a long time with that stuff. I was like, yeah, polyvagal, yeah. that's, I'm going to teach this stuff. I know this stuff like great. But then right. the more and more that I research the nervous system, the more and more I realize uh -huh. this is just a model and we know so yeah. little, you know, yeah. like, yeah, it's it's just it's the beginning of a story, but there's uh, it's it's uh, there's yeah yeah yeah. What what I like about Porges is that um, I mean I, I it's funny you mentioned that because I was just going to bring up polyvagal theory and and sort of ask you about that because what I was going to say is you know I'm pretty I'm pretty steeped in those communities through SC which is pretty you know we use the polyvagal theory I do TRE the tension and trauma we use polyvagal theory as our model. Um, I do, I do the safe and sound listening protocol. That's, that's poor, just this thing. So these are all sort of polyvagal specific, um, kind of interventions, but I was going to ask you that exact question, which is, which is, um, now the few times that I've heard him speak, I actually do detect humility that, you know, I've heard sort of poor, just himself say, Hey, this is, this is a, this is a, a way of organizing some things, this is telling a particular story. This is, you know, science is something that evolves. So, so, so I actually sort of picked up a bit of um, flexibility in his, in his model, but we can see these tensions where there's, where there's people who are, you know, polyvagal theory is the end all and be all. And then people saying, oh, but this thing doesn't work and this thing doesn't work. So I was going to ask you about that. So I'm glad you brought it up and anything else you would share about that tension? Well, yeah, I think it's, it can be the case, right, where you have the founding egghead or the founding genius that really right. is a real scientist and real scientists know, like, you know, for example, um, the I can't remember his name right now, but he runs the research lab at Harvard. Uh, Lichtman is his name. Um, he said, if okay. you know, if if knowing everything there is to know about the nervous system is a mile. We're at three inches. Right. Yeah. Uh, and like, so like the greats have that humility, you know, and, and yeah. that's one of the reasons why they're, they keep on getting driven into the literature and, and because the yeah. literature is constantly changing and evolving. And if you keep on being mm. dynamic in that way, the, the, one of the only responses is humility. You know what I mean? Mm. Cause it's like, you, you just, it's just yeah. like, it's, it just keeps on changing and then you're faced with the complexity of life. And at some point, you know, so it's like, you almost have to be a mystic then. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's why I like embryology because right. things get, you know, because more and more that you study embryology, I mean, the nervous uh -huh. system is one thing, but then putting right. it but all together, the rest of the embryology. That's, yeah, that's a whole nother thing. Fun, not unbelievable. Yeah. And that yeah, was yeah. pilo erection number three of the, of the call for me. Oh man. So you're, you're, you're going there. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, with polyvagal, you know, it's, uh, and I'm really glad to hear that about Porges. Um, I think it's really solid research. I, I, I want to get trained in the yeah. safe and sound model myself. I think it's I think it's great neurology. But again, you know, often yeah. what happens is you get this yeah. this brilliant founder, and then the trickle down effect, um, the the, the grandiose the grandiosity yeah. starts to take root in the followers, who then start to other other 
modalities. And these aren't the folks that are deep in the literature. Right, exactly. That same othering dynamic. Yeah, that same othering dynamic. And, right. the, and the people, they, yeah. they just kind of take the model, which is an oversimplification. Polyvagal theory is an, and, and any model has to be an oversimplification because otherwise our brains would just break. Yeah. Because, you know, 85 billion neurons, yeah. like how, yeah. do, how, how do you even, you, you know, like, come on. I like to play with this idea that um, there's there's branding in neuroscience, just like there's branding everywhere else. And like, right. you know, uh, scientists, what they do is they dedicate their entire career to just one or two nodes in the network. And, right. and of course, right. uh, Porges's node is the vagus, and it's a radically important node. But, for example, the periaqueductal gray, which, is, which has been my passion and my love for decades okay. now, yeah. Um, yeah. is in my books, of course, and this is how, in my judgment, this is how neuroscience works. Like, you have to get passionate mm. about a structure in the brain. And you can study that for yep. literally 30 years, and, and it'll still keep yep. on opening up. But what it starts to look yep. like is it, it starts to look almost like religion. It's, yep. it, it's like, but, yep. it, it, but it's like a neural structure in the brain instead of a deity. Yeah, you know what I mean? And it's like right. the, almighty the almighty Vegas. Vegas. Yeah, let's yes, bow down. Yes, all oh, the Vegas and then and then like Bud Craig, he's in he's the insula guy. You know what I right, mean? And it's right, the insula right. and interoception right. and it's all about interoception right. and and safety from right, an right. insula standpoint as opposed to a a right. Vegas standpoint. You know what I mean? Right. And then right, you exactly. have Alan Shore yeah. and his orbital front, the orbital frontal cortex. It's the orbital <laughs> right. frontal cortex, you know? And, <laughs> right, um, right, right. Okay. Brain religion. Yeah. I'm liking this. This is a good yeah. framework. Yeah. 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 So I think a bit of that is happening, right? Which is that you see, you can see that my Jungian thinking is, it is now kind of moving yeah. into the neuroscience domain here. And that doesn't mean that this that yeah. these models and maps aren't useful, but let's yeah. let's uh, kind of try to differentiate function from from uh, the actual science. Like for example, um, the McLean the triune brain model um, is right. is a timelessly useful model. I mean, it, it's just like right. I still work with this model with couples. But it's like it's essentially right. wrong. Yeah, it's just a it's a convenient <laughs> yeah. story that is not very well, that's, true. Well, so yeah. that's the thing, and 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 this yeah. goes back to the narrative mind that we're primarily narrative right. organisms, and right. and given the the enormity of complexity in the brain, I think it is wise to hold it that way. That that polyvagal theory is yeah. is a is a it's a heuristic. It's a useful narrative that has clinical u yep. utility. Yep. Uh, but yep. it is just a tiny. It, yeah, there's lots of parts of it that probably aren't there's true. There's lots of parts of it that aren't <laughs> right. true. Yeah. And like, for example, the periaqueductal right. gray should very much be in that model for it to be more whole. Right. Like, it, it's, it's like, you know, if I, in the visionary somatics book, I am deeply yeah. ensconced in uh, Panksepp's theory, uh, you know, basic emotions theory, and, which really centers the periaqueductal gray as the center. Right. Now, of course, I'm bringing thought like what I'm bringing to the book. I'm I'm saying, you know, basically right. what I just said. Hey, you know, but yeah. the, my style of teaching is let, let's kind of out myself as I'm doing the right. thing that I'm doing. Uh, and, and kind of like be critical of the thing that I'm teaching about while I'm teaching it, which has kind of confused right. students in the past, right? To be critical of the thing that you're teaching. That you're, a, you're like, here's my thesis and here's <laughs> exactly, the antithesis exactly, at the same exactly. time. It's kind of right. got me in trouble right. in the past. But, but to me, that that's more... There, it's something, there's honest. It's an honest yeah. approach. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. One example, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher the... Um, I'm going to butcher the details because I, I only intermittently review my, my neurophysiology, but like a few years back, and I wonder if you tracked this, but a few years back, 
they sort of, you, you may recall, this was, the, I think it was around 2020, 2021, and some, some kind of, you know, neuroscience study came out that said, hey, we took mice and we, uh, so there's sort of, you know, when we come to the stress model and HPA axis is kind of a longstanding understanding of the, of the neurohormonal you know, what mounts the stress response hormonally in a, in a, in a nervous system. And then there was this sort of study that where they, I forget what it was. They cut, they cut the connection to the pituitary gland or something like that. And then, and then, and then they, they saw that the role of um, osteocalcin, which is a hormone coming from the bones. And that even if they kind of severed the, the main, uh, pathway of the HPA axis that 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 osteocalcin alone was totally sufficient to raise heart rate and to mount the stress response. And so basically, it was like saying this tr this model that everybody thinks of is is how it works. If we cut if we cut the mechanism, this other mechanism does the exact same thing. Which which to me was just sort of like this re revelation around that kind of to your point about you know we're 3 inches of the way to a mile that our that our neural that our neuroscientific constructs are super duper useful we know a lot we should be proud of that and we should be pretty aware that 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 even sort of tried and true physiological principles can get modified or adjusted at any time but so that was just one example that stands out for that's me that's brilliant yeah to really challenge this uh, reductionism that's trying to narrow things into bottom up and top down. It is right, all right. in the middle. It's all in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's in the middle, right? You know, and that proves it, you know, kind of like neuropeptides are just not yeah. well understood. And they're they're yeah. more ancient. They do um, they do a broader range of things. So they, you know, you you mentioned basically a calcitonin, uh, the calcitonin peptide, which I'm basically uh -huh. right okay. in the middle of studying peptides right now and coming up with an integrated cool. you know mishmash of hopefully it's not a mishmash. Hopefully it's coherent. But like how yeah. uh, coming from this perspective that we know so little. Okay. Right. What are some things that we do know about peptides? Okay. Peptides okay. like oxytocin. Yeah. Now, peptides, um, they do basically hormonal things and neurotransmitter things. Okay. And what you've just uh, described is, well, hang on. So you're telling me that peptide stuff happens in right. bones and it does a bottom, quote unquote, bottom up yeah. stress thing. Right. And that what that does right. is that balances this idea where there can be this obsession regarding top down. Let's snip right. the top and wait, hang on. Now there's a bottom up. But like, right, like it can go. But like yeah. the reason why I'm saying that it's always in the middle is that yeah. everything is an integrated whole, right? Like, you, you know, there yeah. are integration hubs in the brain for example the cerebellum is like the bee's knees to me like to me the cerebellum mm. is like understanding the cerebellum and cerebellar computation is where it's at in terms of the future of somatic psychotherapy interesting um, to me like watching a master like levine in my in my books with where i'm at in the neuroscience literature is is that he's a master yeah. of the cerebellum He's a master okay. of working with the cerebellum clinically. Uh, okay. and, and, and that is counter to this kind of classical framework of kind of top down versus bottom up psychotherapy. Right. And this is one of the grandiose things about us somatic uh, therapists sometimes is we're the bottom up people. Yeah. Yeah. We're the bottom yeah. up guys. The bottom yeah, up yeah. People that yeah, focus yeah. on, on on teaching people how to do top down regulation uh -huh. but but and then the yeah. thing is is that like you know the structures that are often prioritized of course are these ones here the frontal lobe structures right right but right, right, like right. more and more the literature is showing how 
crucial the cerebellum is, which is a subcortical structure and has 80% of the volume of the brain. 80% okay. of the volume of the yep. brain is in the cerebellum. Okay. And it okay. is, and, and so yeah. th then we have this uh, discourse that is back front and front back. So yeah. like, and not only that, yeah. of course, we have yeah. core to the periphery and periphery to the core. So thinking that nature yeah. is working in lines is just wrongheaded, right? I mean, it's just working as an integrated, it's working whole. as an yeah. integrated whole. Yeah. 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 Super cool. Wow. So loving this. Um, can we talk about your book? It, it, what's, what's the title? What's the What's the theme? When's it being released? Um, what's what's happening yep. with it? Uh, yeah, so it's called Visionary Somatics. Um, I'm under contract yeah. with Inner Traditions, um, and okay. it's I'm shooting to be done with it by June. I've been at it for about three and a half years now. Um, nice. So, and really, what originally it was going to be kind of like a manual. Uh, for somatic therapist beginners. But okay. then I started to write it and I was like, this isn't me. Like I, I need to go complex because to me, that's what biology and psychology is. It, it, it's, it's the study of complexity and it's learning how to elegantly and usefully dance with complexity. So it end, it's ended up being a, a, a complex philosophical and biological work that is okay. is um, trying to do what we're doing. You and I, we're doing this multimodal thing, this interdisciplinary thing. So it is yeah. within that tradition. It's very much in an interdisciplinary tradition. I move from yeah. concepts like the racialized body and talking about how mm -hmm. oppression impacts bodies um, right. to immunology uh, to yep. embryology and then into, you know, just full blown philosophy and then back into like the neurobiology of trauma. So it's like a, I mean, it's me, right? It, it, it's, it's who I am. I'm an interdisciplinary guy. Yeah. Um, there's weirdly yeah. enough, there's still a little part in me that wants to apologize for not being a specialist. You know what I mean? Even though I have to, kind of, I have to play yeah. that, that game because we're in, yeah, of course, we're yeah. in capitalism, right? So I still have to say, oh, I'm a trauma resolution specialist. Yeah, I right, still right. feel like I have to say, right. or, and then somehow... A, yeah, you still have to claim your specializations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. the thing is, is yeah. that it's like, yeah. uh, as Michael Shea used to say, um, it's like an obstacle course for mystics. The, the uh. book is like an obstacle course for mystics that are really Ooh. interested in science and really interested in living on the cu cutting edge of life. Cool. Yeah. Oh, very cool. So if, if your release date is June ish, you know, that's um, so that makes me think that probably the, at least the, the main body and bones of the manuscript are there. And are you, kind of in an editing phase or, or how, uh, yeah, that well, I'm, fair I'm, I'm hammering it? down the last hardest part, which is the cutting edge science. Right. I've done the, the hard yards with the philosophy. I'm, I've done the hard yards with the science. I'm hammering that down. Then yep. the rest will be easy for me, which is a bit about archetypes and a bit about uh, clinical practice. And then I'll send it into yep. the editors and I mean, I'm saying that like it's easy, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you're closer to the finish line than the than the entry point. Oh, yeah. So that, that's yeah. probably good. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, maybe like you and you've already alluded to this, but I but I would love to hear you unpacking it. Um, and it might it probably relates to your book, but. um. You know, if I if we look at the last 30 years, you know, I sometimes say, you know, my interest was first I got interested in modalities like rolfing that were kind of rooted in, I don't know, 1950s, 60s, 70s era frameworks around the human experience. And then and then and then I got sort of swept in with the term I use is the neurobiological revolution. I don't know exactly when it started, but maybe around the turn of the millennium or something, you know, it doesn't have a clear beginning. 
you know, as sort of a big phase where we're, and so that's, you know, I needed to, I really wanted to study that, uh, that side of things, the trauma resolution models and how does that fit in to the, to the work that I, that I do. Um, but in terms of kind of like where we're heading, like what, what's, what's your perspective on, on the field, the field of some, of maybe, maybe somatic psychotherapy, but maybe we could include um, touch, touch frameworks as well. Where, where do you see us heading in the next 10, 20, 30 years? It's a great question. Um, I feel drawn in the direction of the science first, and then maybe we can go from there. Um, yeah. One of the linchpins for uh, uh, at the cutting edge of science, let's put it this way, uh, is the yeah. astrocyte. Okay. okay. The astrocyte is a glial cell and it is the uh, kind of the linchpin to a new paradigm called the tripartite synapse model tripartite synapse okay. model, um, which is a fairly new model. Um, and basically what the astrocyte, astrocyte teaches us, astrocytes um, basically hold the integrity of the blood-brain barrier together. Okay. 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 But they're also basically, because they're an immune-sensitive cell, they're the glue yep. between the nervous system and the immune system. Mm, okay. okay. And so, okay. um, so astrocyte research, and not only that, what's important to note about astrocytes is they're a essential part of the core metabolism of the brain from a molecular mm. perspective. So glutamate and GABA, mm. glutamate and GABA, glutamate's mm -hmm. an upper, GABA is a downer or inhibitory, okay. and they're just like pistons, yep. like parasympathetic, sympathetic on a molecular level. Um, and okay. astrocytes are essential and, you know, like the core metabolism of the central nervous system runs on glutamate and GABA. Astrocytes okay. are primary to this, yep. this, um, the, this metabolic workhorse in the central nervous system. And, and what, and what's mm. important about that, of course, is, is that it, it's the bridge, the astrocyte is the bridge between the nervous system mm. and the immune system. And so all this mm, talk okay. about the microbiome and yep, immunity yep. and inflammation, there's this huge discourse about inflammation, right? Totally. It's just like yeah, going like yeah. crazy. Yeah, and at the center yeah, of yeah, that yeah, from yeah. a neurobiological perspective is the astrocyte, which is, in, and so, and so astrocyte research is like, if I had some money, I'd put, <laughs> I'd put it, I'd put it down and I'd find some astrocyte researchers. Astrocyte that are, research. Yeah. That's, that's where yeah. you'd invest. But, yeah, but yeah. functionally, okay. yeah. so then the reason why I've gone to science in that regard is yeah. like, how can we let biology teach us about where, where, where biology is that sociology and clinical practice needs to go? Because to me, bio, okay. biology is already ahead of us, like way ahead of us. So we need to learn from biology right. rather than the other way around trying to teach our biology about how it could be how to conform to a, a sociological model yeah. or something we should we should be learning from the biology yeah like I'm neural network yep. computing right it's supposed to be modeled or inspired off of neural networks but it is way behind what neural networks actually do you know what i right. mean so yeah. you know so like yeah. so then from that perspective like what can the astrocyte teach us about where we should be going or where we could be going which is integration okay which is okay. integration. You know, it's like, uh, we're, we're, I think wh where we're headed is we're, we're going to be moving out of neurocentric paradigms. Okay. okay. Paradigms that okay. Are, and models that are that centered just on the nervous system and, yep. and models that take us into the complexity of what biology actually is rather than try to reduce things reduce it to into models system. and identities that can be repl replicated models okay. and identities that can be replicated, you know, and then we, and then we just get, end up being in a fractured field. Uh, yep. Just like science is a fractured field. Just looking at, looking in a narrow, looking, looking carefully at a narrow perspective. Yep. So, and I think, yep. you know, 
And AI is going to, you know, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly with this stuff. But the good part is, is that me personally, I think AI is good, good at doing interdisciplinary weaving. You know what I mean? Mm. It can, it, it. Seeing connections that a human might not see. Exactly. So I think that the future has something to do, or I, let's put it this way. I hope. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that the future has something to do with what we've been talking about throughout this whole episode that, and, yeah. and, and it does carry forward the vision of people like Ida Rolf and then general systems theory yeah. that there's something yeah. in biology. There's something in the cosmos that is in, in integrative in ways that uh, our identities and our opinion you know, need to learn from. You know, and, yep. and so I just think, I just hope that we can continue to be more integrative in that way. And that, and to me, that means just kind of walking around going, holy shit, we don't know what's happening. And that's a good thing. And that can make us come alive, mm. you know, with the, the Even mystery more. of life. Right. Yeah. And we can be celebrating yeah. life a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'm liking that. So to me, there's this meta theme of, um, uh, you know, the humility and as opposed to to grandiosity. I mean, that sh- when you make the shift from into an integrative model and recognize that there's so much more that's there's so much that's working intrinsically that our understanding has not even come close. Made some great, amazing starts and models. But it, but if we can kind of keep staying humble in the face of the integrated whole, there's 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 much more for us to learn and, and embody. My paraphrasing. Of that's great. What I yeah, think I yeah, hear that's from great. you. That's great. Yeah. That that way. Why can't biology? What biology does in its enormous right. integrative complexity? Why shouldn't it right. be our primary teacher? Our teacher, you know, yep. like, and, yep. and that means that it's not, it, we are far from saying, oh yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? That to, to, I heard a scientist once say that, um, a liver cell is just basically a simple machine. Like mm-hmm. what? Like, mm-hmm. you know, no, yeah. no, yeah. no, no. We're talking uh, just radical elegance and complexity at a yeah. molecular scale. And that's magical. It's magical. Yeah. So, and it could, yeah. it could really be our teacher and we've got it the wrong way, wrong way around. Yeah. Mm. Very rich. Yeah. Well, Brian, I just uh, 1 million percent appreciate um, this time to hear your thinking and thoughts and explorations. And yeah, I just feel a huge resonance with the, with the paradigm that you're, you're bringing. Thanks forward. Alex. Really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Redbeard Embodiment Podcast. To learn more, visit us at redbeardsomatictherapy.com or send me an email at alex at redbeardsomatictherapy.com. If today's conversation resonated with you, help spread the word by subscribing and sharing with others. Hope to see you next time.